That's Luke is a new caller in Farnham. Hello, Luke. Hi, how are you doing? Good, thank you. What would you like to say? Um, I'd pretty much like to oppose virtually everything Mr Nash said just a moment ago. Um, he mentioned the scientific background of physicians' associates, which uh, if you actually look at the entry requirements to most physicians' associates programmes, it's incredibly far-reaching. Um, there's no standardisation of what a physician's associate will have been taught prior to that two-year master's degree. Um, I'm a doctor well, pres- who Presumably, did... if you do a German degree, you, you wouldn't qualify to get on the two-year course. Well, no, not quite. But, for example, podiatry, there's various degrees that I don't think necessarily give a good clinical science background to then go on to do a physician's associate degree. Um, the most sort of simple scientific ones like biomedical sciences, biological scientists, um, pharmacy, nursing, you know, there's some great degrees that would give you a great basis, but there's also a hell of a lot of irrelevant degrees that they would still count. So who, um, who, who, who is behind the rules and regulations here? Who creates this acceptable list? I think it's just the institutions themselves, but the physicians associate schools, some of which are directly linked to medical schools and they just basically draw up a list of degrees that they find acceptable to then allow people to be eligible for the course. So you don't think they perform any useful function at all? I don't think they perform zero function but I think the list is so wide ranging that I think using that as some kind of evidence to support why physicians associates are useful it's not part of their clinical teaching their clinical teaching is limited to two years not the four or five or six years that medical students then get taught but if i mean we all know that there is a lack of gps in this country at the moment and, and i'm assuming that that's predominantly where pas work in, in gp surgeries um I mean, i'm sure they're in hospitals too in in, in some cases um but if you isn't it, couldn't it be seen as a sort of short-term solution where they, they are given patients where they wouldn't that there's no complicated diagnosis to be had or that they can see follow-up appointments uh, once the GP has seen people initially? The very difficult thing is determining what a simple patient coming into a GP surgery is is an incredibly complex thing. You know, GPs are highly trained individuals who are able to work out retrospectively, yes, that was a simple case. But it's very difficult to sort of stratify patients coming into a GP surgery as having a very simple problem that can be given to someone in a less qualified role. Um, It's incredibly easy in hindsight to say, yes, that was a simple urine infection. Um, Give them three three days of antibiotics and off they go. Um, But it's something that isn't incredibly easy to do, and that's why things are going to slip through the net if we continue like this. Can you um, comment on what Stephen said about GP training, where the, the, he alleged that the BMA uh, have always voted against to expand the number of GPs being trained and have limited it to 4,000 a year? So I think, first of all, what he quoted was probably a very outdated opinion of the BMA. I think probably 20 or so years ago when healthcare as a, as a sort of an entity is in, entirely different to what it is nowadays, the BMA has been for years, I'm not a representative of them, of them, but I'm speaking on behalf of myself as a member of the BMA, um, has for many years promoted basically trying to increase numbers of GPs training across the board, not just GPs, but all specialty training applications to be increased. For example, I'm one of the lucky 4,000 that will be in August starting the training to become a GP, but unfortunately, roughly 7,000 may miss out. And the irony that a physician's associate who has studied for two years can just waltz into a a GP surgery while those 7,000 or whatever the exact number is miss out just seems a bit ridiculous. Okay, Luke, thank you very much indeed. Let's go to Sarah in Harrow. Sarah, hello. Hello. Well, I don't come with any scientific knowledge or background, um, but as a patient who's experienced, um, administration of the uh, physician associate. Um, but when I rang up for an appointment, um, because I was concerned about an issue that I had a health issue um, that was really quite serious, um, I wasn't told 
uh, I was offered the, an appointment with, and I was so pleased to get an appointment, but nobody on the reception desk actually said to me, this is somebody who's just on the two years training. And, and the person themselves, when I saw her, she didn't say anything either about her background or training. And so I didn't go in with any prejudice about her role or her experience or training um, until I walked away from the appointment and felt, well, I'd been kept waiting a very long time anyway. And I don't know whether that's because she took longer to write up her notes or perhaps consult with a doctor. So I waited about 15 minutes anyway when I got there. And when I walked away, I felt really very dissatisfied, very disillusioned. And I actually you know, said to my mother, I'm not going to see an associate doctor again, a physician associate again, because um, and then I suppose based on that experience, I just felt so dissatisfied. Um, I just I, I felt something there was I, I didn't I didn't get a sense of her being very experienced or really understanding the issue, and thought that I'd wasted my time going. So Mm. if I'm offered that again, I will turn it down and say, no, I've had an experience of that. I don't want that again. Thank you. Sarah, Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Adam's in Birmingham. Adam, what's been your experience? uh, Hi, Ian. Um, So I'm an ex-physician associate, um, and I'm now in my second year at medical school training to be a doctor. And so I have two years remaining of my training, and then I'll be a qualified doctor. Um, so I'm calling to speak as someone's got experience of both sides mm. of, of the situation. Um, so when I worked as a PA, many of my duties were sort of indistinguishable from that of a doctor. You had at least three years um, more training than what I had. And really what I brought to the team wasn't unique. Um, and what was your original degree in? Um, so my first degree was in pharmacology, then I trained as a physician associate and now I'm at medical school. Um, what I would say is, um, just coming off uh, what Stephen said earlier on there, um, although PAs do a range of different, usually science degrees before going into the PA course, it doesn't really add a great amount of value to um, their training because the science basis of most degrees is not clinically focused. Um, so my pharmacology degree didn't even really help in the the first year of my graduate entry medical program. Um, all of the science, you know, pharmacology, physiology, anatomy, was clinically focused and largely new to me. Um, so I, I don't agree that you know that three years and then two years thing is really true. Really, a PA has two years of training to do what they're then doing, seeing currently undifferentiated patients in primary care and in hospitals. And when you were seeing patients as as a PA, w- would you always disclose to them that you were one? Uh, yes, I did. So I would always introduce myself as being a physician associate. I did introduce myself as part of the medical team, but I would always state I'm not a doctor. And I would always say that they'd be reviewed by my consultant soon after, which was fortunately the case where I was working, but isn't necessarily the case everywhere else and certainly isn't the case in many general practices. Because I think, I mean, that the very phrase physician associate, um, I, if I was, as I say, I'd never heard of the phrase until today. But if, if I went into a GP surgery and said, um, uh, and I was told I was seeing a physician associate, I would automatically assume that they were fully trained. That I mean, a physician, to my mind, is a doctor. An associate could mean an associate of, of the surgery wouldn't necessarily mean a junior position. Maybe the, the phraseology needs to change. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, I personally hold the opinion that the, the title needs to change. Um, I think the current position of um, a number of um, concerned bodies is that the title should revert to what it was several years ago, which was physician assistant, um, which whilst still says physician in the title, it's very clear that they are an assisting role and not, yeah. you know, an, an associate or part of the the, the medical profession. Um, I personally think that physician in the title at all is misleading. Um, physician is one of the protected titles in the Medical Act, used to describe a fully qualified doctor who's done a medical degree. Um, so I think physician probably needs to go from the title entirely as well. And what's concerning is that the law has recently passed through the House of Lords um, that will write the current physician associate title into law as a protected title. Um, and I think we urgently need to look at trying to, to roll back on that. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, of course, the whole phrase junior doctor has been under discussion as well in, in recent months, people will, will recall. Because in a sense, that if, if you're called a junior doctor, people assume that you're just still in training, which in a sense, OK, you, you are, but you're still fully qualified as a doctor. So um, what's in a name, eh? Adam, thank you very much indeed. 